Octavius V. Cato exemplified the best qualities of his generation. He excelled in sports, he excelled in academics, he excelled in community leadership. He was the future perfect for the African American community. And had he not been cut short, Mid-19th century Philadelphia bustles with industry, immigration, and post-Civil War promise, especially for the city's African-American community. Octavius Valentine Cattle embodies the community's hopes and the city's tensions. There was this urgency for not just enjoying the trappings of freedom, but the urgency to participate in the process, the urgency to rise above all expectations, the urgency to break down the barriers. And that's why many people call this period of Cato the first civil rights movement. This desire to exercise your freedom is just so human. It's just so human that why not? Why not? Cattle was born in South Carolina in 1839 to free mixed race parents. In 1848, his father, then a widower, moves the family to Philadelphia. In many ways, Philadelphia is one of the most precarious cities of the North, at least for free black Philadelphians. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, passed just two years after the Cattle family arrives in Philadelphia, incentivizes the kidnapping of free blacks. Even in the North, abolitionists face violent opposition. Mob was a verb in that era. It was a verb that described what white men and boys quite often did if there was an anti-slavery lecture or meeting in town. They would mob that effect. How free is free when you worry constantly about your children's safety, about whether or not they will be kidnapped and tortured for you to never see again? Free black Philadelphians find safety and solace in each other and in institutions, like the Institute for Colored Youth, an advanced academic high school that trains students for intellectual careers. Octavius Cattle enrolls in 1854 at the age of 15 and graduates valedictorian four years later. In 1859, he returns to the Institute for Colored Youth to teach. The Civil War propels cattle into activism. Pennsylvania faces an emergency when the Confederate Army invades the state in June of 1863. Caddo raises a company of black volunteers to join the Pennsylvania Emergency Militia. The company that Caddo recruits presents itself at Harrisburg to the commandant of the Department of the Susquehanna, uh, Darius Couch. Couch refuses their services. Couch makes it clear that in Pennsylvania, only the services of white volunteers have been asked for. And so Caddo's company is turned away. With the North victorious, slavery ends in 1865, but exclusion based on race doesn't end. Like many young men, Cattle loves to play baseball. 
He is the captain of the Philadelphia Pythians, who go undefeated in their first season. In 1867, he appears before the National Association of Baseball Players and makes the case for his all-black team to be allowed into the league. In a lot of respects, he was the Jackie Robinson of his day. Like today, sports is kind of like the last frontier. If you can break the barrier in sports, then um, the rest of society kind of follows suit. So I'm certain that Cattle must have understood how important it would be for blacks to do well in baseball. Not white baseball and black baseball, but baseball together. Out of 266 other applicants, Cattle's team is the only one with black players. And when the decision comes down, they are the only team denied admission. He worked very hard to try to integrate it. Uh, he didn't succeed, but uh, he had a vision that was so far ahead of where others were. African Americans believe the end of slavery will usher in a new era, and Cattle's generation won't be deterred from fighting for equal rights. With each generation, the actions become much more aggressive. And I think it culminates with the activities of Lacan and Cato. Octavius Cato and Caroline Lacan meet at the Institute for Colored Youth, fall in love as activists, and plan to marry. These were students who had come out of a school that really empowered them, that they were change makers. In 1867, Cattle and LeCount succeed in their long-standing campaign to integrate city streetcars. So while Octavius Cato is pushing for a state bill to open up the streetcars for everyone, Carrie LeCount has a plan to make sure it's enforced. When a streetcar driver refuses to let her board, LeCount obtains a court order. The driver is fined the equivalent of $1,000 in today's money. To blacks living in the South Street Corridor, the heart of the city's elite black life, this is a victory. To poor whites who live across the street in Moya Mensing, it's a warning sign. Competing for low-wage jobs, whites see black rights as a threat. They denounce African Americans like cattle as members of an inferior race trying to displace them. The one thing which keeps this from going lethal is the fact that blacks cannot vote. So blacks are, for all practical purposes, politically powerless. That will change dramatically when the 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution are adopted. Passed in 1868, the 14th Amendment grants automatic citizenship to anyone born in the United States. The 15th Amendment, passed in 1870, gives black men the right to vote. The African-American population in Philadelphia at the time of cattle was 11%. That was a serious threat that set off what modern Americans might call a white backlash. Political, economic, and racial tensions collide in Philadelphia's election of 1871. Octavius Cattle leads a registration drive for new black voters, hoping to have an influence over city elections for the first time. Neighborhood boss William McMullen gathers the Moya Mensing Fire Company in his saloon. He urges them to maintain white rule with the same kind of mob violence seen during slavery. On election day, in organized fashion, police and Moya Hose men physically beat up and took black voters out of line accosted black men in the street. It was a day filled with terror if you were African American.
six black men are shot. Octavius Caddo goes to the office of Mayor Daniel Fox and begs for the city to intervene. But Fox has no interest in protecting black voters. So he turns to Caddo and says, you'd better protect yourself. He goes to Third and Walnut and buys a gun. Uh, it has no bullets in it. And he starts walking back home. As he walks home, a white man, already bandaged from the day's violence, spots Caddo on South Street. And shoots him, dead. His remains are taken back to the Institute for Colored Youth, the school that he helped to run. And people from the neighborhood came that night to pay their respects and gathered around that schoolhouse right there at 9th and Bainbridge, it's still there today, uh, and encircled that building as if to embrace it and protect it. Octavius V. Caddo's funeral procession will be one of the largest Philadelphia has ever seen, second only to Abraham Lincoln's. They were great inspirational figures, and so their death were not only tragic and devastating, but it removed these very uh, voices that people followed. Black people knew that there was enormous risk in terms of life and death in coming up against white supremacy. But we have many examples of them continuing to do so. Octavius B. Cattle's life and death leave future generations with questions we as a nation still face. What will be the direction for the lives of people of color? How will black men and women live in a nation where slavery no longer exists, but it's very clear that equal rights, that citizenship, that these very ideas will continue to be contested and are contested for centuries to come. Thank you.